Thanks very much, Fergus. It's great actually to be here on the first Thursday night of a new year. This is my home church, incidentally. This is where I started my ministry way back in 1967, and the Lord has brought me back here. And John Cunningham, I have to say, and the whole congregation have given me a great welcome. I wondered at one stage, having spent a lifetime being up front and conducting worship, how I would fit into sitting in the pew. But I'm going to be honest with you, John and the congregation have made it very easy for me. And I'm delighted to say that I'm a member of this congregation here. But delighted as well to be with you here uh, on a Thursday night. You know, if you know me actually over a period of time, you know I don't like to be outdone by other people. And I said to myself there, you know, Valerie got a word. But the funny thing about it is the Lord had given me a word as well for this evening. So I think he must be in a good mood. He must be pleased at us. He's given us two words here this evening. So uh, if you'd like to just close your eyes for a moment, I'm just going to bless you with this word that the Lord has given. And it's not just for tonight. It's for the whole year of 2023. So just, be, just sit there and just be receptive to what the Lord wants to give you. So I bless you now with this word. It's from the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And maybe just as we're still in an attitude of prayer, I always acknowledge at this moment, especially at the beginning of a new year, how much I need the Lord's help when I'm in this position here, just about to speak. So I wonder if in just a moment of silence, all of us just quietly could just welcome God to breathe the life of his spirit into the words that I'm going to speak, into me, but also into you, that you may have a listening ear to hear what he wants to say to you. Let's just welcome the spirit to come now, please. Lord, that's a great sense of peace as we just remain quiet in prayer before you. I think that's a sign, Lord, not just that you're here with us this evening, that's a great gift in itself, but that you've heard our prayer and you're responding and you're releasing your spirit and you're touching these words and you have a personal word for each one of us here this evening. Now, Lord, at the beginning of a new year, that's exciting. A personal word from you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you realize actually the Christmas season isn't over yet. It doesn't end until tomorrow, which is the Feast of the Epiphany. But I hope that you've had a good Christmas. And I hope that people give you lots of presents. Now, I got a lots of presents this year. People are always very kind to me. But one of the best presents that I got actually was from my old friend, Eric Lewis. And he bought me a book with a sporting background. It was called Hooked. And it was about Paul Merson, who was a famous England footballer in the 1990s. He played over 30 times for England. But he was also part in the 1990s of a great Arsenal team who won the league at least a couple of times and won the cup a couple of times. But even though he was a famous footballer and he received the adulation of an awful lot of people, especially when he was playing well on the pitch, there was a sadness in his life. And it was a sadness that brought him almost at times to the point of disaster because he had a problem with addictions. 
Not one addiction, but three serious ones. He had a problem with gambling. And he said that that was the most serious one of all. And he said that whenever gamblers lose money, the only interest they have is how they can get that money back again. And they want to put on more money. And then they lose more and more. I think he lost hundreds of thousands of pounds in the course of his career through gambling. It could have been millions. He didn't exactly put a figure on it, but it could have been millions of pounds that he lost. But he also had a problem with drugs. And he said that was the easiest one to overcome because he very quickly realized that in the taking of drugs, he could just wreck himself completely. He could kill himself. And he found the fear of that kept him from taking drugs too much. But alcohol was always a big temptation. There were times he said that he would ring round his friends. Were they able to come out with him? This was in the morning. And if they could only come with an hour, he wasn't interested. But if they could come for the whole day, then they headed for a pub and he wasn't getting home until late at night and he had been drinking the whole time. So those addictions, they weren't just a sadness. They brought him almost to the point of disaster. And he fell so many times. It wasn't dozens of times. He must have fallen hundreds of times. And I think the book was a book of courage because the man fell so many times and he had to pick himself up again and carry on. But one of the points that he made I found interesting. He said the thing in life that gave him hope that he could overcome his addictions one day was the addiction groups, you know, Drugs Anonymous, Gambling Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. Whenever he was going well, they kept him on the straight and narrow. And whenever he fell, it was the fellowship that he received there and the message that he received in those groups that got him back again on the straight and narrow. Now, there's a wee sense, actually, in which I've had a similar experience, not to do with addictions, incidentally, but that I had a similar experience to Paul Merson, because I had an operation a year and a half ago, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've had an awful lot of setbacks in that last year and a half. Times whenever you were nearly ready to touch the finishing line, and you thought they were there, and then you got another setback. And sometimes those held you up, actually, uh, you know, for quite some time. But if Paul Merson found that his hope was in being able to go to addiction groups every day if he needed it, and then they had sponsors whom he could contact regularly, if that was his way out, the hope that I found was always in the Lord. Because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? So for me in the last year and a half, it has been absolutely mandatory to walk as close to the Lord as I possibly can, to keep my eyes on him, and then whenever I fall, to look up and keep coming towards him again. You know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said one time, the, the world is on the path to destruction because man has turned away from God. But if man will realize the error of his ways and reach his hand out to God again, he'll find the warm hand of God waiting there to greet him. And I always find the warm hand of God waiting there to greet him, to greet me. But you know, there was one particular way that I kept in touch with the Lord that was very important to me. I spent time every day listening to him. The Lord gave me that gift in a very special way, way back in 1982, where I was able to hear what he was saying to me. And in the last year and a half, it has been a very valuable gift. He has given me so much hope through so, through so, many, so many messages that he, has, that, that he has given to me. You know, Andrew Murray, that famous South African minister, said, what God says to us in prayer, far more important than what we say to God. And it was certainly what God was saying to me uh, that brought me great comfort. I have only time to mention three of the things that he said to me. Whenever I got a bit concerned, was I ever going to get better from this hip operation? I went back to him on, on, on every occasion. I nearly said almost every occasion. That wouldn't be right. On every occasion, he said, you're going to make a full recovery. And at times he went even further and he said, David, it's a beautiful thing when the Lord addresses you by your first name. David, you know, I'm making a new man of you in body, mind, and spirit. 
And then one day, I just got up. I was sitting on the edge of the bed, waiting to get up and go into the bathroom to get myself washed. And again, he spoke. This was the best one of all. David, you're going to spend eternity with me in heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, it doesn't get any better than that. I always knew in my mind where I was going to when I left this earth. But after that, it was there in my emotions. I could feel that the Lord, not just allowing me to spend eternity with him, but he has chosen me and he's welcoming me to spend eternity with him. So I would say to you, I don't know what your difficulty is as you move through 2023, but what I would say to you, if you could follow that example, walk as close to the Lord as you possibly can. Keep your eyes on him. Canon Jim Glennon of St. Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney used to say, be promise-centered and not problem-centered. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes away from the problem that you're facing. And then take time to listen to the Lord. And I think that you'll find, as I have found, that as he speaks to you, he never says discouraging things to you. He'll give you only words of encouragement and words of hope that things in time can be so much different. So staying close to the Lord, keeping your eyes on Jesus. You know, the writer of the book of Proverbs has a wonderful message on that theme there. That uh, verse that I read to you at the beginning was from Proverbs chapter 3. This wee passage is from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22. My children, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Brothers and sisters, there are two particular ways in which the Lord speaks to us. He speaks to us through Scripture. I don't think I ever read a passage of Scripture without getting something from it, without the Lord giving me a word in that particular passage. And it always helps if you take half a minute or a minute before you start to read the passage to welcome the Lord to breathe the life of His Spirit into the words that you're going to read. That's a surefire way to actually get, get a word from him. So he speaks to us through scripture, but he also speaks to us actually in a personal way. He could speak to you sitting here just in a pew. He could speak to you walking down the street or driving a car on your way home or in your room before you go to bed. He can speak to each of us in a personal way. Now at one stage when I had had what I thought was a serious setback, I sat down one day with the Lord and I said, Lord, I was hoping to be better by this time, but I still think you want to make me better. Now, what do you want to say to me? What advice do you want me to give? And I took the little notebook with me and I started to take notes. And the first thing that he said to me, I want you to give up drinking tea and coffee. I want you to drink only water. That has actually been a great blessing to me. But most days I sat with him and I took notes on what he said. And I'll tell you what I do now. I read through those notes every day. Because if that's a word from the Lord, I don't know about you, but I don't want to lose it. But there's times actually when I have lost great words that the Lord has given to me. Times even during my recovery when he gave me guidance and I took it for a couple of days or maybe even a couple of weeks. And then I went back to making my own decisions. And that wasn't right. And I wanted to avoid that. So everything that the Lord gives me, I write it down in that little book of about 20 or 30 pages of notes of things that he has said to me, and I read them every day. You know, there was a famous cricketer, captain of the Australian cricket team, called Richie Benno, in the late 50s and early 60s. Great cricketer. But whenever he retired, he became a commentator on cricket. And he and his wife traveled throughout the world for about 50 years, and he became probably the most famous of all cricket commentators. But I heard him being interviewed one time, and he said, actually, there were certain principles that he adhered to as a cricket commentator, about seven or eight of them, and he wrote them down on a card. 
every time that he did a broadcast, whether it was a big broadcast or whether it was a small one, he took out that card and he read those seven principles so that they be right there in the forefront of his mind as he did the broadcast. Now, I'm saying to you, you could get a little notebook and you could sit with the Lord and say, Lord, how am I going to get through this? What do you want me to do? Is there anything you need me to stop doing? Lord, will you please give me guidance? And then as he speaks to you, take a note and do it every day. But adhere to what he asks you to do. Read those notes every day and then be obedient. Brothers and sisters, it's a great spiritual principle. Very simple. But obedience to what the Lord asks us to do always brings a blessing. But refusing or turning our backs on what the Lord asks us to do deprives us of a blessing. Now, I don't know about you. I know what choice I'm making. Because if the Lord hadn't blessed me on so many occasions, even in the last 18 months, life would have been so much more difficult. So whenever the Lord gives you a word, hold on to it. Keep it in your little notebook. Read it every day and be obedient to what the Lord is asking you to do. Now, I've just got one final point here, and it's a very simple one. When we stay close to the Lord, when we're close to him, we're in a position where he can speak to us very clearly. And sometimes he can say something in the whole healing process that we haven't thought of up to now, but it's something that can make an absolutely significant difference. Let me give you an example again from my own life. Even just in the last couple of months, in the last few years, my blood pressure has gone quite high. Paul was with us on a number of occasions in Cali, Colombia. In fact, Paul, you were the person that introduced us to Pastor Hendrick and opened up really wonderful experiences for us. I don't know if you were there, Paul, the year that down is about 2010. We went down into the main square in Cali in Colombia and they were given free blood pressure tests. And a girl took my blood pressure and she said, you're okay. You've got the blood pressure of a young man. But at some stage after that, it changed, and my blood pressure went high. And on the first Sunday in December, um, I decided that I would take it, and it was still very high. And I said to a friend of mine who knows quite a bit about these things, that I was trying everything that I could uh, to, to get the blood pressure down. I was trying to take as much exercise as possible. I was trying to keep my weight down. I was drinking water. I wasn't drinking coffee, which can sometimes, you know, a whole host of things I named to him. And then he said, did you remember what Joel Furman said? Maybe that name doesn't mean anything to you, but Joel Furman is an American doctor who wrote a very famous book on fasting and eating for health. And in that book, he said, he had never known a person who came to him with high blood pressure, no matter how high, and that blood pressure didn't come back to normal with three to four days of fasting. Well, I felt that was something I hadn't thought of. I really hadn't. I should have, because I'd read the passage many times, but I hadn't thought of it, and yet my friend brought it to my attention, and I decided I'd go on a fast. So that was a Sunday, the day that I took those, the blood pressure. Just couldn't get it down. The, 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 the medical people would have been alarmed at how high it was. But on the Monday morning, I was starting a fast. And I fasted all day Monday, all day Tuesday, just drinking water, incidentally. That's all I take. And then Wednesday afternoon, my friend came down and he took my blood pressure. That was after about two and a quarter days of fasting. Would you believe, brothers and sisters, it was down by a good 50 points. Just over two days of fasting. I'm not saying the Lord is saying that to everybody, but he was certainly saying it to me. It was something that I wouldn't have thought of, but I believe the fact that I was walking so close to God in so far as I could placed me in a position where he was able to suggest something which would be very, very helpful to me and might even bring a complete change. So since that point, I've been very much back into fasting again, and I feel it has helped me, not just with the blood pressure, 
but in other areas of my life as well. So I've been saying three things to you here this evening, brothers and sisters. I'm saying if you have a difficulty or sickness, walk as close as you can to the Lord. That's the place of safety and the place of security. One of the ways of staying close to the Lord is by spending time listening to him. So get yourself a little notebook. Sit down quietly with the Lord. Ask him for guidance as to how you're going to get better. Take notes of what he says. Read those notes every day and be obedient to what the Lord is telling you to do. And finally, as you do walk close to the Lord, just remember, as you stay close to him, you place yourself in a position where he can speak to you and maybe make a suggestion to you that you wouldn't have thought for yourself. But as you practice that suggestion, put it into practice, you may find that it's not just helpful, it's something that just transforms the situation completely. Could we just be quiet for a moment, please? Lord, thank you for that beautiful peace. Thank you for that lovely stillness. Lord, it would be hard not to believe that you're with us. You're hearing our requests. You're responding generously as you release your Holy Spirit. So thank you, Lord, for the way that lives are being touched here this evening. People's relationship with you. Anxieties that they have in their minds and physical health problems as well as other people whom they're concerned about. Thank you, Lord, for the way you're touching people all over this church here this evening. And Lord, we want you to get all of the glory. Help us, Lord, to take our eyes off ourselves, to get our eyes on you. Lord, there's a great song that says, It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. So, Lord, we thank you, we worship you, we praise you, we adore you, we glorify you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross and what you've been doing here this evening. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this night and forevermore. Amen.